All right, I, I do want to address something I heard on, on Saturday, just briefly. Uh, just the, the misdefined words of the Bible. When, uh, uh, when you see somebody put a spin on something to lighten it up and make it less severe or less dramatic or less fearful than it was intended to be. So anyway, in the epistle of Jude... Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, see, giving themselves over to fornication, <laughs> going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body. Moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. And he goes on, Woe unto them, they've gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. And we've talked past weeks about Balaam and Balaam's ass. And they perished in the gain, saying of Korah, Spots in your feast of charity, feeding themselves without fear, and on and on he goes, raging waves of the sea, foam out their own shame, wandering stars, and on you go. Well, I wanted to deal with the word lascivious because our lasciviousness, because we heard it defined as, uh, uh, we heard the word lasciviousness in reference to this scripture defined as foolishness. It was defined as foolishness, as though it's foolish. For someone to believe that somebody else's sins aren't forgiven. And that was the definition, their definition of lasciviousness. So I just wanted to steer that, spin that back into its proper position. Okay, lasciviousness uh, means unbridled lust. Unbridled lust. It means shameless, continual excessive giving yourself over to lust look at the context we're earnestly defending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints the faith that we can manifest the righteousness of god and go on to perfection now that's the context we're contending for the faith and what's the context certain men turn the grace of god into lasciviousness Grace perceived and taught in such a way that it allows the continued, unchecked, unbridled, undealt with continuation of, of lust. And if you go on there, he gives the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. So who are the ones that are not pursuing the faith that's once delivered to the saints? Who are the ones who are abandoning this faith? that was once delivered to the saints, that we must contend for. Who are they? They're the ones like the Sodom, who go after, they defile the flesh, unbridled lust, with no shame. So that needs to be clarified. Because if you see lasciviousness as any other way, you're going to look, look at that scripture, and it's going to uh, hit you in, in lightness. It's not going to have the impact and the weightiness that God intended that scripture to have. All right, Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we said before, God called, his own, God called his own people Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to relate to maybe Sodom and Gomorrah and continue also in Matthew 24 where I started last week. As I started there and there's some things I wanted to finish off. 
But you see the point there? Sodom and Gomorrah giving themselves over to fornication. And that's important, giving themselves over. Because there is no shame. There is no fear. And that's what lasciviousness is. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, defining the term Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember in the book of Isaiah, God dealing with His people in the state of sinfulness and forsaking God and forsaking His ways. He said, give ear, you rulers of Sodom, you inhabitants of Gomorrah. That was the word of the Lord that God gave to Isaiah, not, not to the Sodomites, because they were overthrown in fire and brimstone a thousand years ago or whatever. He is talking to his own people, Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus was crucified in that spiritual city which is called Sodom. Sodom. Well, he wasn't. And, and Egypt. So Sodom then becomes a type of worldliness, lust, and pursuit of flesh, and, and all of that, in an unbridled way. So you define the word. Sodom means licentious, idolatry. Now we've been taught by from many different sources, and this is very easy to entreat, when you seek your own pleasure, or if you please yourself, or if you serve yourself, that is idolatry. You are the idol. That's the, the basic condition and state of iniquity. Right? Iniquity is as idolatry. It is. It's idolatry. Covetousness. You want things for yourself, to please yourself. Covetousness, which is idolatry but sodomy is licentious idolatry it means people feel like have they have a sense of entitlement to pursue this they have a license to do this we are delivered so that we can do these abominations and we don't have to worry about the consequence and you hear people preach on uh, the dominion of sin and that sort of thing and uh Death, no, a sin does not have dominion over you. And, and the, the perception is that the penalty of death no longer has dominion over you, whether or not you sin. Which is not what it means when Romans 6, we, we preached that a couple of weeks ago, or last week or the week before. Read Romans chapter 6. I'll challenge anybody to read Romans chapter 6. Sin shall no, no longer have dominion over you means that the spirit of sin eventually is not supposed to have the dominion to control you to do evil actions and deeds. But you can see in, in, the, in the book of Jude, those who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness are into the excessive pursuit of lusts. They, dis, they defile the flesh. They give themselves over. We're not talking about someone who's in a battle in a war rustling against temptation. No, we're talking about someone who just gives themselves over. All right. I don't want to go too much. I just but I did want to clarify lasciviousness and it, it I I no longer fear to do that stuff because that stuff can't be taught in the church. We the our generation is already too slack. It's already too far to the right. It's already too far on the side of grace, allowing too much. Our grace is too greasy. Sort of an interesting play on words that American uh, democracy and American culture is kind of based on of the Greek, Greek philosophies and stuff. I don't know, the writings of the Greek philosophers. That, that thought pattern, that democratic or free, free will sort of thought pattern. Western civilization was built upon that kind of thing. So, and then that has crept into the church. And so the, the church tries to define their grace according to those Greek ph philosophical <laughs> terms or thought patterns. So there's too much grease in our grace. You might say G-R-E-E-C-E. -E -E, too much grease. Well, that, when we talked so many times about... Uh, the idea of uh, individual civil liberties and rights, 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 and how that genders to uh, condition people to feel like they are entitled to something. And that's that, that same mindset has crept into the church and perverted the way that the Christian perceives about grace. That's the whole thing. We are delivered to do these abominations. In other words, uh, they're not saying that God has... Uh, has directly instructed them to do the abominations. But what they're saying is, as we can do these abominations, we don't have to worry about the consequence. We're delivered. 
But that's not true. That's just not true. Matthew 24, just to kind of review, last week we talked about the advent of technology in the last hundred years has put us in the only time frame where the literal fulfillment of many of the prophecy of revelation could come to pass with one new world order and a a one world economy and a mark of the beast and a universal economic system and you know the mark of the beast and the right hand or in the forehead and that's all very imminent and very plausible as you see uh, the whole world inching towards uh, or speeding towards a cashless society and uh, I was thinking a lot about being dumbed down and, and not to be critical about it, even, just even in reference to myself. I notice, and I'm trying, uh, my own personal pursuit is to try to get focused. I find it very difficult if I get too occupied and too many things to get focused, and that's going to be a strategy of Satan, is to interrupt, 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 until all your thought patterns are extremely short and fragmented, and each fragment is not related to the other fragments. That's what Satan is trying to do to our generation to dumb them down. Now you think of, think of your cell phones. Well, you have a notification can come up on your smartphone for every kind of thing you've got on your sm- smartphone. Okay, you know, I, I buy stuff on eBay, and I have the Weather Channel, and I have the News Channel, and I have uh, 10 other... Uh, applications on my phone and each one of them every few minutes bing giving you a notification oh there's a sale on it ebay 10 percent off or bing you know some news item some alert 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 constantly distracting causing you to change the focus of your attention change the focus of your attention change the focus of your uh, uh, attention and uh, at what time I had been exposed to um, television and like many times, I don't know whether it's music videos or other things, a lot, a lot of the time, maybe not all the time, but a lot of the time, you'll see that the strategy of the visual effects is to uh, watch a video and have the camera change to another focus, another picture, repeatedly, very quickly. Well, there's a, there's a work that goes on where it dumbs us down and kind of fragments our thinking. I'm going to try to talk about that a little bit. Well, we know that uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and knew not. It's what I'm talking about is the preoccupation of things in the world and the distractions and the fragmentation of your thoughts, not allowing you to put pieces together and see a bigger picture, not allowing us to uh, be fully impacted by what a vision of what's really going on in terms of the destruction of the world and the nearness of the coming of the Lord. So, you know, I guess I'm as guilty as anybody on that. I struggle with it as much as anybody, but... For what it's worth, that's where my thoughts were going today. All right, I'm going to go back to Matthew 24. Jesus went out, departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And see ye not all these things? There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So only his disciples came to him. He's only telling this to his disciples. You know, he's, he's doing this privately. So the world's not supposed to clue into this and everything else. But it's not supposed to come on us unawares. And I know I'm preaching what we already know, but I'm just, for, for however it may serve us to bring it to our remembrance. So take heed that no man deceives you. Many shall come saying, I am Christ. You'll hear of wars, rumors of wars. These are things I dealt with last week. Nation rises against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You know, talk about wars and rumors of wars. We've just seen the airstrike of Donald Tr- Trump in the United States against the uh, top general commander of the Iran army. And uh, we're seeing the fallout of that. And uh, we have the Iraq and Iran, those the two horns that have to be uh, broken. So that's interesting observation for us to pay attention to as far as the fulfillment of prophecy and the things we've been 
taught about that and we've heard about it. So those are beginning of sorrows. They deliver you up to be afflicted. They'll kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise, deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When you shall therefore see that the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, who so readeth, let him understand, and let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that get stuck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And the word flight there is best to relate to uh, the scripture in Hebrews. After you were first illuminated, you endured a great flight of afflictions. So that's really what it's saying. There's going to be you know, afflictions. And of course, the next scripture says, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect before. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so also shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Here's a scripture we've been focused on. and uh, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, which is the great tribulation, right? The tribulation of the end of the age. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then, immediately after the great tribulation, then shall appear the sign then of the Son of Man in heaven. Now this is a scripture that's in reference to Jesus Christ himself, the high priest, the head of the body. Okay? Now, there are, there are men of God that can uh, rightfully uh, uh, magnify themselves as having a son of man status. And we know the scriptures in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is the prophet that magnifies the idea of a prophet being identified as a son of man or a man of God being identified as son of man. And this is all, this is all valid and everything else. And when the people wanted a sign, God told Ezekiel, tell the people... Ezekiel, you are the sign. And that's all, all valid. I'm not saying that's not valid for man of God who are, who are called, in fact, called to do that, to, to say it, magnify it, that's fine. But this scripture is immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, on the basis of this Matthew 24, 29, it, it, this scripture has been um, emphasized to point out just the simple logic that the rapture cannot be before the tribulation. Because anyone who thinks and believes in pre-trib uh, pre -trib rapture, that the church is going to be cut out before the tribulation, that doctrine does not fit in with this scripture. You can't get that doctrine past this scripture. Right? It's just like you, you think you can justify prosperity doctrines, but you can never get a prosperity doctrine past the scripture in the Psalms that said, Behold... These are the ungodly, they increase in riches, they prosper in the world. How do you get a prosperity doctrine past that scripture? And that's why you'll never hear that scripture preached by the prosperity preachers. Because that is an absolute there. I, I hold that as an absolute. You, so, it, it, and similarly, you cannot say that there's a pre-trib uh, rapture because of this scripture. You just can't get a pastor. And, and likewise, you can't say that, that this sign of the Son of Man in heaven is anything other than Jesus himself. Because it's after the tribulation. And it's the sign of the Son of Man, not on earth, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So sons of men can say they're sons of men, and they can tell the people of God they're the sign, but they are not the fulfillment of this scripture. 
Okay? So, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Uh, come on, this can be nothing but the Lord himself descending from heaven. It couldn't be anything else. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The Lord descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. You know, the whole thing. Right. And flaming fire taking vengeance in all the glory of God He's coming. And the dead in Christ shall rise and leave which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord and they're all going to come. We're all going to come down as a unified, consummated body of Christ and we're going to come back down to earth and it'll be the beginning of a thousand years where we'll reign and rule with Jesus Christ. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of our Christ and we will be kings and priests and we'll be in positions of rulership and authority for a thousand years and reign and rule with Jesus Christ. Comfort one another with these words. Well, that's what Matthew 24 30 is talking about that event. It's echoing that event. It's the same thing. And he shall send his angels with the great shout of a trumpet. See? And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When the branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. And all of us here have heard for years how the fig tree was uh, the fig tree budding and. Uh, Putting forth its leaves was Israel becoming a nation in 1948. He goes on, When you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that they were before the flood, or for us before the flood of affliction of the great tribulation, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. In other words, occupying, pursuing worldly things, the things that the people in the world do. And it became a distraction and a fragmentation from focusing and staying on and allowing the vision of God to accumulate and grow and become comprehensive. When your thinking is fragmented, you lose the ability to perceive and comprehension. And what does the Bible say? That you may comprehend with all the saints the breadth and the height and the width and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. We're supposed to know these things. You know, what the eyes not seen, the, ears, the ear has not heard, neither enter into the heart of man the thing that God has prepared for them that love Him. But God has showed it to us by His Spirit. We're all supposed to know. Now, you may not be able to stand up and expound it and preach it for hours on end, but I don't care if you're the lowliest, simplest saint in the body of Christ. If you are uh, exposed to the preaching of the Word of God and you have the mind of Christ, the Holy Ghost will anoint you. You will comprehend the fullness of what we're talking about. You'll get it. Your heart will perceive it. You'll be inspired by it. You'll be moved by it. You'll be challenged by it. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get challenged to shake, shake, shake ourselves. I wish I could do it better. Pray for me. I wish I could shake myself more than I am. I'm, I'm laying hold on it. I wake up every morning and I think about it. How do I do this? How do I do this? It's so easy to think of. It sounds like it's so simple. It somehow is difficult. Well, maybe that's because of my infirmity. But it, nevertheless, this is what we're doing. We're being challenged. We have to be shaken. And we've got to shake ourselves. That's, that's the purpose of uh, intense preaching, right? Because it strikes. It, it jolts. It shakes. It takes the, um, the reality of what's happening and, and drives it in so that the uh, awareness of what's really happening in the world is renewed in our minds. It stays there. It stays there longer. It's harder for that impression to escape your conscience after you hear it. That's why God's ministers have to be a flame of fire. 
Uh, this is the condition of our generation. We're dumbed down. I'm dumbed down. I mean, I go around sometimes and I'll put a tool down and I'll be at work. And 10 seconds later, I don't know where I put that screwdriver. Where is it? And I said, God, what is this? Oh, teacher sent from God, expounding the great mysteries of God's eternal purpose. Where did I put that damn screwdriver? (laughs) Well, it's kind of humbling, right? Well, (laughs) right, so I'll relate to it. But, uh, and I'm going to say this again, I said this at um, Anne's funeral because I thought it was something I could put in there that would kind of, I could springboard and sort of speak to the people if, because we, I was anticipating that we had a, a mixed crowd there, some of us very serious Christians, some nominal Christians, maybe some unbelievers, and I didn't know. But, you know, everyone talks about well, you'll know where I'm going with this because I told you all this before, but for what it's worth. Everybody was talking about Saddam Hussein and the weapons of mass destruction. And what were they? They were the big bombs that are going to blow up and kill all bunch of people or whatever it was. Or uh, this biological warfare that's going to send a disease and destroy all these people. Now, these are all catastrophic physical manifestations of destruction widespread. You know, just think of that. And then think about uh, what the Bible foretells about, you know, uh, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And we've seen tsunamis and natural disasters take out hundreds of thousands of people in a moment's time. Well, those are not weapons of mass destruction, but weapons of mass destruction have a similar effect of imposing a very uh, dramatic and uh, a, to a large degree of destruction in a very short amount of time, that's impossible to ignore the, the catastrophe of it. You can't ignore it. It imposes itself upon you, and it's uh, God allows it to allow it to strike us, to make that impression. So you have weapons of mass destruction. Well, if they drop an atomic bomb, you're not going to have any problems being fearful. You're not going to have any problems being jolted into a state of, of, of fear and carefulness and oh my God, your everyday normal life is going to stop and you're going you're gonna to immediately be intensely focused on the almighty God and on your, your path of salvation and what is being Worked out and fulfilled, and how close are we to the end? You won't have any problem changing your focus because it's so vivid. It's to such a large degree. It's so traumatic, so catastrophic, so widespread, so obvious. Weapons, that's weapons of mass destruction. And we know that in cases of catastrophe and calamity like that, what happens? Often people who weren't particularly uh, had any affinity to one another, all of a sudden, everybody, for the purpose of survival, all of a sudden, nobody's proud anymore. <laughs> Nobody cares who their neighbor is because we need to survive and everybody needs everybody else's help. So I don't care what I, issue I had against you when we lived in prosperous times and I was pursuing my own pleasure. We need to survive. We need to help each other. You see that all the time? Uh, I'm not, not everybody. Some people are wicked and they try to loot the stores and they try to exploit calamities. But you see, to a large degree, all of a sudden, total strangers and everybody will start to cooperate on a very big scale. So what is it? It just destroys the idea of individuality and selfishness and uh, pride and pleasing self. Just completely blows it out like a big wave. So... That's what uh, calamity and weapons of mass destruction. And, and it tends to be a fairly obvious thing, isn't it? So that's why I say we have, we have a worse problem here, or you might consider it a worse problem, and I call it the weapons of mass distraction. Yeah. Oh. WMD, weapons of mass distraction. What's that? Well, that's, uh, that's our information age. That's your social media. That's entertainment. That's movies. That's sports. That's... That's everything that is meant to just to be a diversion, a distraction. 
something to pull your focus away and put it on this and then take your focus away and put it on that and then take your focus away. One of the greatest uh, vexations of the state that I'm in now is that uh, I got too many people that call me for maintenance issues and so on and so forth. And I can't seem to stay focused on one thing when someone's pulling me and calling me on another. So this is a whole thing I've been wrestling with, uh, saying saying no and trying to uh, um, exercise that as a self-discipline, if you will. But uh, all I can tell you is, and I've told you this before, it's not quite as easy said as done. As done and they, when, when those uh, people who are asking you are extremely persistent. And anyway, I've, I've come to recognize it as, a, as, as, as one of my weaknesses. If I'll volunteer my humility, if I can do that in a righteous way. Like the Bible, I'm, the Bible talks about voluntary humility. I, I'm not trying to volunteer humility to impress anybody, but I'm saying that. Well, this is how I relate to it personally. And uh, I'm I getting better at it. And But I'll tell you, if we can't shake these things, God will help us with a calamity. If some calamity comes, I won't care about what's out there anymore. If that's what it takes. Just remember, we enter into this world and we are saved. And when we are saved, we, we enter into salvation and we come to the Lord in a condition of dullness, of dullness. Slowness of heart, dullness of heart, slow hearts, um, slow, slow to comprehend, slow to respond, and slow to get the fullness and the severity of things. All right, so the weapons of mass distraction. Now that, that is way more subtle than a weapon of mass destruction. You know what I mean? Uh, it would be... Wouldn't it all, almost be better to have an atomic bomb go off? Because there'd be no question about it, would there? But weapons of mass distraction, and I'm not, uh, that, that's, this is the devil's strategy. So, you look at Lot, and I've preached this before too. So, distractions, uh, what the devil wants is he wants to provide enough continual distractions to fragment our focus on various things. And uh, then you become disassociated from reality. That's almost a, well, it is the technique of mind control. You ever heard of the monarch program, mind control, and how they used to, uh, you know, they, they take people and at a very, very young age, they, they expose them to trauma, torture or pain or electric shock, and it causes them to uh, disassociate themselves the trauma makes them want to escape from themselves and fragment their awareness so they to to try to flee the trauma and so they purposely induce the trauma to fragment them and then when they fragment them they can become a open open field or open game to all kinds of unclean spirits they can program these people to do things they actually become programmable mind control well, there are things Satan is trying to do to uh, cause mind control on a mass scale. And it has mainly to do with distractions of entertainment, technology, so on and so forth. You want to be aware of that. Then what are you? You're drunk. You're drunk, not drunk in alcohol, but drunk in the sense that your judgment is impaired, unable to perceive the reality of the dangers that are coming at you, not able to navigate life just like when you're drunk, you can't navigate your car, you run into a pole, right? You can't navigate, you're spiritually drunk, you can't navigate salvation, you run into a sin. You run into a distraction. You know, how shall we escape if we neglect. neglect? And that's the net result of fragmentation and distraction. Is The, uh, the, the net result is, is the willing or unwilling neglect of working out salvation. Now all manners in a blasphemy, whithersoever men shall blaspheme, shall be forgiven, but he that blasphemies the Holy Ghost. One of the aspects of blaspheming the Holy Ghost is going to be a constant uh, ignoring of the call and woo of the Holy Spirit. Doing that continually for a prolonged period of time until finally God will give up. Now I'm not 
I'm not hoping that and I'm not threatening that on anybody here, but I'm just saying and that is part of the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And that's what the Bible says in Hebrews. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? All right, so the same day Lot goes out of Sodom and Gomorrah, it rains fire and brimstone from God out of heaven. Remember Lot's wife, right? Lot, Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. In other words, a heart that's hardened and can't not respond or react or appreciate or perceive what's going on. And uh, what else? Yeah, back to, back to the definitions of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom means licentious idolatry, which relates to what I was saying in Jude, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness uh, and, and that sort of thing. And Gomorrah means make merchandise of. Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, what does it say in Ezekiel 2? This was the sin of Sodom. Abundance of idleness, pride, fullness of bread, yeah, and the abundance of idleness was in her. Pride and haughtiness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. This was the sin of Sodom. And that state of heart ended up manifesting in the flesh as giving themselves over to pleasures, giving themselves over. All right? Licentious idolatry. And then Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah is making merchandise of. Now, what generation? What generation? Have you seen more of so-called Christian people making merchandise of the things of God than our generation with television preachers and all, and so on and so on and so on? And if you want to look at it outside the Christian context or outside the organized so-called Christian denominational or tele-evangelical world and just look at it in the world in general, what, what time in... Our world is so focused on making merchandise of everything. You know, I remember as a young kid saying, well, boy, they'll never make merchandise. Like, water, water is the type of God's spirit, you know. And water is so fundamental, and water is free, and you just get it out of the tap. They'll never make merchandise out of that. I actually said that in my heart. They'll never make merchandise out of that. And what did they do? Make merchandise out of water. And water is the type of God. So this is our generation has made merchandise out of God. Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's talking about the church, really. But the world has done it too. But what happens? The church loses its savor because the church will not make righteous judgment. They won't hold a standard. They won't preach true holiness of God. The ministers won't teach the God's people the difference between the clean and the unclean, between the, the profane and the righteous. Won't, won't do it. And what happens is they see Egypt and they follow in the shadow of Egypt. So Egypt merchandises something and then the church says, well, hey, we can merchandise it too. And we can make money. And why with money, see, love of money is the root of all evil. Why with money we can increase our Outreach, but the problem is, there's nothing wrong with outreach if God wants you to outreach, but the outreach of denominational Christianity, by and large, today is a mandate of their own religious imagination. And it becomes a dead work. You can't make merchandise of God. You can't measure your success by how much money you get. Or your status with God with how much money God gives you. God, and... So the church has made merchandise of the people of God. And with feigned words shall they make merchandise of you. Sodom and Gomorrah, give ear, O ye rulers of Sodom, and you, uh, Sodom, you inhabitants of Gomorrah. That's Isaiah talking to the people of God by the word of the Lord. That's what God calls us in this generation. Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus was crucified as a result of the Jews. Now the Jews didn't actually do it, but the Jews delivered them over. And this, the, uh, the Christian denominational world is going to be more than happy to deliver people like us over to the new world order. You go to prison or be beheaded or crucified or whatever it is. 
everybody knows that even in his history, and I can't cite examples, but I just in my spirit I just know it's the truth, and you either, either believe me or you won't. The destruction and downfall of great civilizations was always preceded by sexual promiscuity, homosexuality, individualism, selfishness, pride, um, uh, pleasing of self. Those characteristics of the state of a heart, that's, that's what preceded the downfall of many civilizations. Even if, you don't, even if you're not a Christian, if you look historically, you'll see that's what happened. It just, it's just that this sexual promiscuity and homosexuality are kind of the epitome of the manifestations of perverted perversion and selfishness. All right. Fragmented thought patterns and fragmented mentality provo promoted by all of this is, is uh, it's, it's subtle. The devil subtly promotes this condition of mind, this dumbed downness, so that the larger and more important, the comprehensive perceptions of God's purpose and the state of the world that would put you in godly fear, that would motivate you to work out salvation, uh, and the conclusions about the state of things, cannot be fully um, embraced by your conscience. Okay, It leaves the conscience unable to feel. So whenever you see people that are extremely fragmented, always changing their focus, always changing their focus, they are not able to feel. They are on their way or already in a condition where they're past feeling. Their hearts have been seared. Their consciences have been seared. You have to dwell upon and give consideration to the depths, to a certain depth of things, to all, for your conscience to have even the opportunity to be affected by it. You understand? So that's we talked about uh, how the church today kind of promotes a um, uh, delete button theology. You know, the Catholic Church is. You know how the Catholic Church is. You can sin in the Catholic Church. You go and confess to the priest, Father, I have sinned. I absolve you of your sin. Kind of like, delete. Okay, go out and sin again. It's like your sin shows up on the screen. Ah, just highlight that sin for a moment. Highlight it. And then press the delete button. Poof, it's gone. Now, and people think that all you have to do is, every time a sin comes up, all you have to do is hit the delete button. Hit the delete button. Hit the delete button. Yeah, swipe to the right. Or swipe. <laughs> no. Christianity is more than that. You just hit the delete button. No, you have to be purged from your sin and you have to come through an operation of God and you have to come, get to the point where the sin doesn't come up on your screen anymore. It's permanently deleted, right? It's, it's not just deleted. It's actually been unprogrammed, deleted from the depth of the hard drive in your computer and cannot appear anymore. But it's oversimplified to just say that uh, you just keep pressing delete, 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 clear, 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 clear. People have trouble in their conscience. Clear, go to another subject. Go to another thought pattern. And they're tormented by that. Clear, go to the next subject or the next distraction. That's why many people who, who overcome one vice by their self-will are uh, many times are not really um, set free indeed by the Lord. If, you, if you're not set free by the power of God, like I told, I always tell the story about my aunt. She quit smoking by her own self-will for I don't know how many years, six, seven, eight years. But you know, people quit smoking and then they start eating more. Or they eat candies. You just you're just moving from one distraction to another. You're not really set free. The torment is still in your heart, and you're still reaching for the wrong comforts and everything else. Well, my aunt, after so many years, sees a cigarette in an ashtray that's burning, and she says, "Ah, just one puff won't hurt." And she did that, and then. Next thing you know, she's smoking again, just like that, because she never was set free. Now, she's since stopped again, but anyway. So, and we know the scripture in Second Peter, knowing this first, that she'll come in the last days, scoffers walking after their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of this coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Certainly when we were at the farm, overcomer ministry, we was we were uh, properly and rightfully so. We were always reminded about this. Uh, this is our generation. We can't. That's the other thing that uh, fragmented thinking does: is it makes you think that oh, all things are like they were from the beginning of the creation. Oh, there's always been wars. There's always been earthquakes. And 
But there are very, uh, there's a lot of things that characterize our generation as unique from the other generations. You can go on and on. Uh, and the sons of God began, to, men, when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, right? Genesis 6. And the sons of men saw the daughters of, sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them to wives, all that they chose. And God said, my spirit will not only strive with man, for, he, for that he is also flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. And I looked it up again, and I did a study on this years back. I studied the sort of the demographics and the population growth of the world, okay? And if you plot the growth, uh, population growth of the world on a graph where the number of people is on the, uh, I guess the Y, the vertical axis, and the, uh, the timeline is on the horizontal axis, what you'll see is that this, the population of man slowly sort of um, rises at a, at a constant rate, slowly, and then in the last, uh, say, 300 years, and even more so in the last 100 years, its spike goes way up. It suddenly, dramatically skyrockets the population. So that agrees with the Genesis 6 condition, as it was in the days of Noah. Well, in the days of Noah, in Genesis chapter 6, man began to multiply. Right? So that's unique to us. Except those days be shortened, no flesh should be saved, such tribulation that was not, ever has been, or never shall be. Really? It was so bad that if God didn't intervene and, and put an end to it, and have Jesus come, everybody would be destroyed? What generation have you lived in where we had the potential to wipe out the entire human race with weapons of mass destruction? Only our generation. Only our generation with biological warfare, atomic bombs, and all that kind of stuff. We can easily destroy the entire population of the, of the earth. So those things like that that make our generation unique, that point us to the end of the age. So... The wickedness of man was great. I could go on and on about this stuff. There are giants in the earth in those days. The sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and grieved them at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast, creeping thing, fowls of the air, it repenteth me that I made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So there is a remnant of God that finds grace. The earth is corrupt, the Bible says in Genesis 6, and it was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted his way. And God said, the end of all flesh has come before me. Now we know God destroyed it by a flood and then he sent a rainbow which was his covenant which said he would never again destroy all life by, the, by means of a flood. But we know that as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So the destruction this time will be the Lord descending from heaven coming in flaming fire taking vengeance. He's coming, he's going to destroy the wicked with the brightness of his coming. And God, God's, uh, the uh, ability of mass destruction that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ is just so, is, is just so much more uh, elaborate than their nuclear weapons that Jesus Christ can come and His glory can pinpoint all the wicked and uh, burn them up and leave everything righteous alone, leave everything else intact. And that's what I believe it's going to be like. Yeah. He's going to come down and His brightness is going to destroy everything wicked and you know, and even if in terms, if you want to look at the physical aspects of the earth in terms of pollution and how the waters, uh, maybe the oceans have been polluted and they're poisoned and everything else, uh, everything is purged by fire. God could just take things that are polluted on a molecular structure, put it under the fire and just purify it, right? Fire purifies. Fire purifies. All the impurities get burned up in fire. And God can pinpoint and get particular with where his fire has effect and where it doesn't and he can do all that instantaneously all at the same time if he wants i'm just surmising i'm just saying yeah all these things shall be dissolved he can dissolve the uncleanness in the atomic structure and leave the righteous untouched all at the same time mm -hmm. while we're standing in the middle of it all yep. right shadrach meshach abednego right in the midst of fire 
So God brings the flood of fire, and that's the days of Noah, and then the days of Lot. Uh, and this is the other thing, is that in the weapons of mass distraction, I, I like to play it on the words because it, you'll, now you'll never forget it, right? Mm-hmm. Now that I put it like that, you'll never forget it because yeah. you correlate it with the weapons of mass destruction, something that you already know about is established in your conscience. So it should stick now. This should stick. Weapons of mass distraction. Now, what was I going to say about it was uh, when um, Abraham's herdsmen, Lot's herdsmen had a strife about the cattle and everything else. And Abraham says, let there be no strife between me and my herdsmen and you and your herdsmen. We're, we're brothers. Uh, just whatever. You, you want to take the land to the left, take it. And if you want to take the land to the right, you take that. And then Lot looked up over the plains and he saw looked towards Sodom and he saw it was all was all well watered and then the Bible says and so Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom pitch pitching the tent inclining the focus of his direction towards Sodom and that's what the weapons of mass distraction are going to try to get us to do or that is in fact getting us to do is orienting our thought and our attention our, and our focus to worldly things, worldly things, uh, worldly distractions, whatever, worldly comforts, all of that. And as I always like to say about that, first he pitched his tent towards Sodom. What happened not too long after that? He was in Sodom. Yeah. Okay, well, all right, so then go back to Matthew 24. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. All the tribes of the earth shall mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's Jesus himself with, with us. And of course, he shall send his angels and so on. Then, the parable of the fig tree, Israel becoming a nation. That also puts us right in, in line with the end of the age. Then hour knoweth no man, not the angels, but my Father only. As the days of Noah were, they're eating and drinking until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Two in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. And we do know what watch, what general period of time. <coughs> the Bible says you know not what hour. And we can go on about that, but I'm not going to talk about that t- today. If the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, he would have focused, right? And not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready in such an hour as you think not. The Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give their meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. Now I look this up. Smite. He shall begin to smite his fellow servants. It means uh, to insult or to strike uh, repeatedly over and over and over again. Repeatedly. And eat and drink with the drunken. And of course that doesn't mean alcohol drunk, as we said before. Anything that's going to, that you pursue, that occupies you to the point that it impairs your judgment, to the, it impairs you and leaves your conscience unable to feel the fear of God, unable to uh, be moved in preparation and, and to consider your conduct and how it affects uh, your brother or, your, or the people of God. It's, it's a drunkenness. So you smite your fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him and sunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What kind of persons ought we ought to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The earth is going to be dissolved, you know. And if we go slack on this, if we neglect, if we live this fragmented uh, life of a fragmented conscience and let ourselves be carried away with it unawares it mean it doesn't even mean that you're totally unaware in your conscience you can be aware in your conscience but your heart is not able to respond to it all you get drunk you're still in pursuit of things 
you, and, and in your distractions, you, you beat the men servants, beat the maid, maid servants. Well, you don't want to do that. So this is all about the end of the age. Dumbed down. Making us drunk. Neglecting so great a salvation. Remember, be careful what we're hearing out there concerning uh, anything that would uh, uh, erode away the fear of the Lord. And, you know, we don't want to be held, held under a, a yoke of ungodly fear, but, but the thing is, all the errors come through lies and lightness. False counsels are going to make things lighter than they really are. We need to be brave enough to face in our conscience the weightiness of, the weightiness, the gravity of what's going on. Turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, excessive amounts of unbridled lust, without shame. Because the conscience has become fragmented. The conscience has, has been locked into an exercise of cha changing its focus from one thing to another in, in such a short period of time, so many times, so consistently, so continually, that it loses its ability to feel. Conscience being past feeling. Shameless unbridled lust. That's lasciviousness. Turning the grace of God into that kind of exercise. Again, lasciviousness isn't just simply a fool who doesn't believe that grace is, can forgive you. Well, I believe grace can forgive. I believe in grace. I believe in forgiveness as I said all along. What we're dealing with is the exploit of grace, the misuse of grace, the misperception of grace, the lightness that's not supposed to be associated with grace, and so on and so forth. But yeah, we have to deal with these things. The uh, idea is a focus. Focus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Jesus. Perfect our godly exercise. One thing have I desired. Yeah. One thing, that's that focus. And these are the things that are going to try to get you distracted from it. So just be aware of them. Now we're in the world, right? We use the world, but we're not abusing the world. You know, we're affected, but we cannot allow ourselves to be extremely adversely affected to such a degree that it starts pulling us away. And that's the admonition. I know it just sounds logical and everything else. And, like we probably already know it, but hey, I put these things in the remembrance, though you know them, and all of that. Okay? Praise the Lord. Bless you.